All right, I'm here with OG Badger, part two. In part one, we discussed how the sheriff's deputies tried to hang OG Badger, and he talked about how easy it is for the guards to get away with this kind of thing in the context of the Epstein story. In part two, I just do want, want to do more of an introduction to Badger. He's got his YouTube channel out there right now. I urge people to go down there. There's not just prison stories. There's all kinds of inspirational stuff that he's doing now. And the link to his channel is in the description box below this video. And if you're watching this on any other channels, um, hopefully there's a link down there to my channel as well. And the subscription logo on my channel is in the bottom right hand corner of this video. So Badger, thank you for doing a part two. Thank Were you. you born in California originally? I was born in City of the Angels, which stands for Los Angeles, you know. Uh, I was born about two miles from here, Northridge Hospital. And how much prison time have you done over the years, including county jail? 21. 21 I, years? Yeah, yeah. There, one violation, five-month violation. And which kind of prisons were you in in California? Because there's a lot of famous ones out there, like Folsom and... Uh, oh. Uh, Soledad, Tracy, uh, for, uh, Delano, uh, Chino, I mean, <laughs> damn, pick a pen. At the time, there was only nine prisons when I had first gone to prison. There's 31 prisons now. What so, year did you first go? 80, I landed in 87. I, I got busted in 84. So in Arizona, the four major gangs, it's like uh, Chicanos and Mexicans are quite a big population. Then whites, blacks, and a small minority of Native Americans. California, you know, the state of California is like the fifth biggest economy in the world. You've got way more diverse groups out there. What's the gang structure in the California prison system when you went in, and what's the gang structure like now? It's always been the same. Uh, Southsiders pretty much are the biggest car, uh, then blacks, and then whites, and then others. You know, uh, when you say gang structure, so you have northern and southern Mexicans. We don't have just like all Mexicans. It's northern and southern Mexicans. The northern Mexicans run with the blacks. The southern Mexicans run with us. Our elite alliance is with them, and the northern Mexicans' alliance is with the blacks. So, well, it's supposed to be that way. It's not like we don't riot against our own, you know, against the southern Mexicans, because we do. And when you first went in, did some dude come up to you and check your charges and explain how things work? So... <laughs> Uh, you're given your 128G uh, is your lockup orders. So wherever you go, you can request your counselor to get your paperwork. So it states on there what your charges are, you know, and they better be good, you know. So, uh, yeah, as far as that goes. And then in the county jail, they have a J, what is called a JRC, it's a green card. And if the sheriffs want you done or off to, you know, I mean, taken, gotten rid of from wherever they are. They'll show you their JRC. And uh, when you hit like Chino at the time, we ran all paperwork. All paperwork would go through us, meaning the inmates, you know, the convicts, whatever. And if you came in with like 288A, you know, that's. That's for sure, guys. You know, it's, uh, lewd and lascivious acts with uh, a minor of 14 or under. So if you come in with paperwork like that, we want to talk to you. We want to hear your side of the story back here, <laughs> you know. And I'm being sarcastic. You're getting smashed, you know. Um, they did uh, S and Y out here, which is special needs yards. But it got so big from all the dropouts or people that locked it up behind paper, you know, paper of dope or a puck of tobacco or something like that. Cause a puck of tobacco is like 50 to a hundred bucks, uh, a paper of dope, which is a smear. Um, like, 
about that big, if you can see, you know, it's just a little dinky smear on a paper, uh, $50. And, you know, just because you go to prison doesn't mean the dope fiend comes out of you, you know. You, you, <laughs> I promise I'll get you that paper, you know, I'll pay for that paper, I'll pay. And the, there's four things to stay away from, on, especially in California, you know. And I would assume most places, but homosexuality, uh, dope debt, uh, I don't know why I can't think right now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I can't think right now. So, uh, sorry about that. Th so you're, you're, you're talking about like, um, debts, like getting debts over drugs, getting debts over gambling, staying away from punks. Yeah, um, yeah. I imagine, um, you know, not talking to the guards, they're going to think you're a snitch that kind of thing same thing is over there i'm sure it's probably the same thing you know i'm assuming i know but then yeah. like so you get locked up you lock it up behind a paper of dope or whatever you're supposed to be a gangster now you have to live with these guys the chomos and the rapists and the rats you know now you have to live with them that's part of your punishment you know because you're not allowed on the main line but they've cut that out they're not doing S and Y anymore because it became too big. It was over. That became the new main line. You know, uh, serious active members were, uh, they were out being out, you know, there's no place to put them anymore. So the main line S and Y. So they started to integrate them back into main you know what they we called the main line the s and y's were special needs yards they would try and integrate them back into the you know i'm trying to think of your language and mine you know to, to, so they understand what i'm saying i don't sound like i'm speaking alien but uh they tried to integrate them back and it was a bloodbath you know what i mean taking all these rats and child molesters and rapists and putting them back in uh, they'd take bus load two bus loads of them and drop them off and Next thing you know, there's a war going on. I guess Salinas Valley just got cracking. You know, it was, there's was a lot of damage done during that riot. I just found out last night when I was talking to my homeboy in prison. And uh, it, it was chaos behind that. Uh, I guess they've cut it out. At first, they were just doing it, taking them from uh, three yards and putting them on EOP yards, which is hot meds, psych meds. So in California, you can't be on psych meds and be a gang member, be an active gang member. So that's what they first started to do, and it was still a bloodbath, you know. And then they started doing it on the lower yards, the one and two yards, still a bloodbath. And when you notice, it was right around time to start asking uh, Sacramento for money, you know. So they played, they play, they're playing chess, big time chess up there, you know. They know what they're doing. They're uh they wanted more money. Hey, our guys are hazard pay. You know what I mean? They're on lockdown, but they're being paid hazard pay. They're, they're bringing home. We're talking about all these hillbillies living in all these little counties that were had nothing before and now have a prison there. And you know what I mean? Uh, they're bringing home 120K a year and just not knowing what to do, all of a sudden they be driving that big truck with that big mouth back and going, and you know, like, <laughs> so yeah, it's off the hook. And you, you could tell most of them were inbred the way they treat us, you know. I can't say that about all COs, there's some decent COs, man. You know, I'll, I'll keep that real. Yeah, it's all a shakedown on the taxpayers for sure. So if you go into the California prison system and you're a white dude, what choices have you got? Can you you got to click up? You can be independent. How can you play it? Nobody stays independent. You know, no, there's a couple of ways to go. That's fine where you fit in, and then there's a Christian car. You know, um, if you're trying to be an active member, you know, you're a skinhead or you know above that, you know, or you're just a peck of wood or whatever. You run generally with your car, your, where your city is, or your vet, you know, like San Fernando. San Fernando runs in San Fernando, but they still associate with all the other whites and Southerners that are from San Fernando, basically. But they associate with everybody, you know. But they don't run together. They, they generally spread together, eat together, and 
you know what I mean? That, that's who you generally kick it with. So is that it? So within the white race, you kick it with people from your area where you're from. Right. So you, you, you're not to do dealings or anything like that from another race. You know, you're, you're not supposed to do any kind of dealings and it's punishable. So I interview people every week. I have like a true crime podcast and I've interviewed people who've been in prison all over the world. And what I've learned is that prisons all over the world are completely controlled by drug gangs. So how big is the drug business in the California prison system? Well, yeah, it's what controls everything. You know, it's just, I'm, I don't understand what you mean by how big is it. It's big enough to run all, every institution in California. You know, that's how big it is. So. so the drug business is the absolute priority of the gangs. Absolutely, yeah. And are, are you able to say the methods by which drugs get into prisons? I mean, anyone that watches YouTube knows it comes in by all means, you know. Uh, have, buying it from the guards, you know what I mean? You have guards that bring it in. They bring in cell phones, you know. Uh, you know, uh, there's, I know a guard that made a quarter of a million dollars in two years cash in, from bringing in cell phones. You know, no, no drugs, but, you know, I don't personally know them, but a partner of mine knows them, you know. So that's a lot of cash, man. It's a lot of cash. Yeah, I'm aware of this, but I'm just trying to get your perspective. How easy is it to corrupt prison guards for the gangs to do that? And how do they do that? <laughs> There's a lot of ways, you know, finesse, uh, fear factor. Fear factor is a big one. Um, finesse is a big one. Um, keep in mind, a lot of these COs uh, grew up with people that are in there. You know what I mean? They just, they just on the other side of the uniform. So, you know, that homeboy love, you know, uh, yeah, I mean, that's not, I wouldn't say that that's the number one way it gets in, you know, um, muling it, you know, just your girlfriend putting her at risk with her three kids out there and having her bring you dough. I mean, I, I couldn't picture asking my, my people to do that, but people do it all the time, man. People do it all the time, you know. So, and then she gets busted and now she's doing time. You know, they've gotten it down because of so many people telling, uh, you know, um, your boy Wes had did an interview and he showed how he hid the phones and stuff. And uh, I think it was like three days after that interview came out, I guess all the institutions were hit, you know? Really? Wow. Yeah. Uh, my boy said they lost 31 phones on that yard. You know, that's a lot of pissed off people at 1800 a phone. He's going to have a green light on him for that. Well, I don't know that they're putting blaming him for that. You know what I mean? I, I, I don't know that he's being blamed for it, but I know that that happened. So, so, so I write books about the war on drugs and the, the black market in drugs gets bigger every single year. That money, they estimate it's almost a trillion a year right now. So that money corrupts every profession it comes into contact with, including the guards, and you've described it brilliantly there, how, you know, these guys grew up with the prisoners. So how easy is it just to pay that extra money to get the guard to supplement his income to bring that in? And I tell uh, people guards are bringing stuff in. They're like, guards don't bring drugs into prisons. What did they do? <laughs> it's like, people are not in the real world, man. But I guess you don't understand unless you've been there. They don't believe that the guards are responsible for any of that stuff over there? Some people don't know. Are they that naive over there? <laughs> <laughs> phone Here, use this one to call it. What, so. what causes most violence in prison? Yeah, drug debts, uh, bad charges. You know, uh, like my homeboy was talking about last night. They were in a two-year riot, okay? So every time they would come off lockdown, they would riot, 
behind nine jellies. Nine jellies, bread jellies that you put on bread. You know, mm -hmm. over nine of those, they were in a two-year riot against another race. Wow. So, it's crazy. Over all your time in prison, were you in any riots? Yeah, absolutely. They call them melees if they're not too big. A riot, uh, I was in probably six what they would call riots, but many of melees, which is usually like 20 people or less, or 20 people or less you know. Then it's just a melee. It's not pronounced as a riot. Have you so. got any good melee stories you can share? Well, I... Uh, I was up at Susanville, and mind you, when you walk in, it says warning, no warning shots everywhere, right? And the weight pile was still open. We still had all that stuff. I thought you were just chugging a bottle of vodka, and I'm like, damn, they're doing it big over there. <laughs> 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 so uh, they, it was Cinco de Mayo, and uh, we ended up getting off with, uh, the south side uh, with the Pisces, actually, my bad, with the Pisces. And uh, I get all nervous when my girl's walking around. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, we ended up getting off with the, uh, the Pisces, and shots were fired. We're, we, we're fighting, whatever, get back. We get down when the first shots are fired, and then we you got to get back up, you know, and you start fighting again. And they generally, unless they see you with a weapon, the first shot isn't gonna be right into your nugget, you know? Like, there was railroad ties around the weight pile, so they shot into that, and a piece of tie had come off and gone into my butt. So, and it burned so bad, I, I thought I was shot, and I was yelling I was shot, you know what I mean? And I got back up and was running towards uh, the track, because we're still, we're in the middle where the grass is, and, you know, so it goes like, that and then that and in the middle is grass and what the weight pile and all that and i'm yelling i was shot and i was trying to stomp on people as i was running to the track to lay down and i he's all get out or i'll shoot you and i was like i'm already shot and uh anyway so they had this like 1956 woody's ambulance come out and to get a bunch of people after they had broke it up right whites went to the uh, one cafeteria and the uh, prices went to another cafeteria. Two cafeterias side by side, you know, but walled off. And uh, the ambulance came to get a bunch of us, you know, and I was, uh, I get back there and I wasn't shot. It turned out to be a piece of railroad tie had flown into my ass. And uh, they actually gave me the nickname Splinter for a couple of days back there. <laughs> Yeah, I was pissed off about that, you know. I hate admitting that story, but it's one of the stories, you know. They were like, hey, Splinter! And I'm like, all right, homie, I got your Splinter. You know, because, you know, they call us Peckerwoods out here, so Splinter would be less than a Peckerwood, you know. So I felt disrespected by the handle. <laughs> yeah, a lot of young people asking me, you know, hey, if I end up in prison, how should I behave? What would you say to a young person who was going into the California state system, how to survive, how to behave, not get smashed? Don't be something you're not, man. You know what I mean? Don't, don't be something you're not. Don't portray some, because if you come in talking about you this, you that, we're going to find out, you know? We're going to find out. We're going to put you to work and we're going to let you live up to what you're talking you did and you're doing and whatnot, you know? Uh, Pay attention, you know what I mean? Keep this closed for as long as you can and keep these open and these open. You got two of these and one of these for a reason, you know? Pay attention to your surroundings. Uh, learn the rules, you know? Um, don't be stupid about, you know, oh, I've done this before, I've been here and done that. It's, man, if you don't know something, find out. Because I remember when I was first hit the joint and I'm coming from county jail, I had grabbed the handrail in the chow hall and, you know, I got punished for that. That was a major no-no for us to touch the handrail that everyone else is itching their nuts and then grabbing on the handrail walking, you know. Uh, yeah, I got punished for that. I, 
you know, it wasn't a severe punishment, but ask questions if you don't know, you know, get in where you fit in. Don't try and be something you're not. Pick your friends wisely. And I, I don't, I say friends, but I mean, pick your associates wisely. And you do become, you do make bonds in there. You know this, you know, I mean, you make bonds. I've loved many men, many men, no homosexuality about it, but I've loved many men, you know, and to watch them go, you learn to just shut your emotions off, you know, like when I knew they were going, I would just, if we kicked it every day, all of a sudden the last 10, when they'd go on uh, S time, that was it. I shut down. I didn't associate with them or communicate with them any further. I'd see them as I'm walking the yard or be like, what's up, dog? I'm like, They're already gone to me, bud. You know what I mean? Like, just keep pushing. And whoever would fill their spot. But it is what it is. You know? Um, and don't be something you're not. That's all I could say. Don't fuck around, like you said, gambling, dope debt, punks. Stay away from those things. You know, you could be all right. It's not like you go there and you've got to pick up a knife and go kill somebody your first day in prison. You know, it's not like that. In fact, things have actually mellowed out to the best of my understanding uh, in there. It's not like it was the wild, wild west. It was prison. You didn't eyeball another man's cell and see what they had in their cell. You mean like, oh, bro, you got coffee? Can I get a shot of coffee? That was an automatic fight right there. You know, what do you eyeball myself for, homie? <laughs> you know, um, yeah, I had a lot of rules to learn quickly. You know, fortunately, I'd been in the county jail for um, coming up on three years by the time I hit the joint. You know, um, so I had the majority of it down, but I also had a whole list of who's good, who's not. You know, it was, I don't know, like, I wanted to cry every day in the beginning, so I just acted that much tougher. You know what I mean? Like, I would do vile things to people. I'd get involved in shit. You know what I mean? I, I did exactly what you shouldn't do when you go to prison, you know? And that was all based out of fear. You know, I'm, I'm completely aware of that today. Did you get in trouble with the woods when you first went in and you weren't hip to all of the stuff? Well, I didn't run wood, so... Uh, I didn't really run, you know, kick it with them. I, I kicked it with a different car. And no, I wasn't, I didn't get in trouble much. In fact, it's, I was one of the people that would be involved in taking care of those that did get in trouble. You know, because I was young and stupid. So. And yeah. you, you mentioned your cellmates then. Who was your worst cellmate? <sighs> <laughs> so they put us uh suicidal was my celly for a minute uh now venice had a gang called suicidals who didn't get along with the car that i ran with and uh he wasn't moving and i wasn't moving so we ended up chunking him quite a bit you know fighting quite a bit uh Eventually, one of us did get moved due to marks that we had on us. It didn't last long, but <laughs> that was probably my, my worst celly right there. My last celly was, uh, it's oddly enough, I, did, I found out just when I was going home, but uh, he was a Jewish guy that he didn't have a Jewish last name, but uh, he, he was, he was, he had been down since the year I was born. So, he, you know, he was, had been locked up since 67. And uh, he was a chalker. He would do portraits of chalk. So he would get dope. And me and him had quite a few head bumps because at first he was like, don't sit on my bed. You know what I mean? And I'm like, well, if I'm not white enough to sit on your bed, you know what I mean? Then I probably shouldn't be in here. You know, and he liked my comeback or whatever, my attitude. And he was like, asked to sit on my bed. You know what I mean? Like, I'm like, all right, I got that. So, you know, uh, and we became pretty close towards coming towards the end. You know, um, I remember he had this big black guy walk by and he threw six caps of weed under the door in a little pouch, right? And I kicked it back out because I was the only person in the cell. 
And he's like, that's for your celly. I'm like, nah, homie, give that to my celly. You know what I mean? Like, my celly didn't ask me to receive something for him, or else I would have. But don't just come by throwing something under my door. You know what I mean? Saying that's for your celly. Hell no. So uh, we had a lot of bump ins like that. You know, like, you ask me first before you have me do something. You don't put me in a position of throwing dope under my cell and then all of a sudden the guards are rushing it, right? No. Uh, my battery's low. <laughs> okay. All right. Nope. So in part one, you talked about the shit that went on with you and the guards. What about the other side of that? Did prisoners have relationships with female guards? One of my own crew, you know? Uh, so I ran was, I guess, against the law over where you guys ran. I ran skinhead, okay? So um, he, one of my car, guys in my car was sleeping with an Indian cop, okay? <laughs> So they're also called skins out here. So, you know, <laughs> so when he comes bragging about it, like an idiot, you know what I mean? I'm like, okay, someone's going to call her and send her a package and she's going to bring it to you. Right. You know what I mean, You're like, oh, bro, uh, uh, you know, let me find out. I'm like, there's no finding out about it, bro. You're sleeping with, you know what I mean? A skin that's not a skin, if you get what I'm saying, you know? And I, oh, now he's thinking he put his boot in his mouth. And I'm watching what goes on at work call each morning. She's calling him over and she's got, you know, three little sack lunches for him. And he's pushing the little uh, wheelbarrow around, pulling the little weeds and going into the guard, <laughs> you know, the guard check, the tool check. And, you know, in there about seven minutes and come out sweating, you know. Uh, <laughs> so I was hip for what was going on, and I, I told him, bro, it's getting that time, you know what I mean? Like, I need that package delivered. And I, he like, I'm getting it taken care of. I'm getting it taken care of. And now he brought a can of to tobacco, right? Mind you, you could still buy tobacco at the store at the time. He's all, she brought me this, dog. I'm like, I don't give a crap about that $6 can of Bugler. You know, like, we need dough. And I go, listen, bro, either get it taken care of or you're going to be taken care of, you know. And me, me and another character, partner of mine, I told him, I go, bro, I'm going to take care of this, you know. And he had the yard. That's why I'm out telling him. He's like, yeah, it needs taken care of. He doesn't take care of Because why, you know, he's breaking all kinds of rules, right? So he's putting us all in danger. He's put himself in danger, put her in danger. I could, in the beginning, I didn't really trip like that. I was like, bro, you know, if you get caught on her, all she's going to do is yell rape. You know what I mean? You're going to catch ad charges. You know what I mean? Like, oh, I got this. You know? I mean, that's when the dope play came in. That was my thinking, you know, and I. Anyway, needless to say, <laughs> I come at him one day with a smile on my face and something in my hand. And he thought, I, I told him, I go, hey, next yard, bring your shit to the yard. You know what I mean? He was one of my cars, so I told him, gave him a heads up. Well, bring your shit to the yard next unlock. You know, and he's like, oh, why? oh Badger, stop. You know, and I thought, okay. So I had given him a heads up, you know, and. Just before I went down, we started a fight over there. Two of my other kids started a fight over there. And, uh, sorry about this. You're okay. Hey, I'm doing an interview right now. Can I call you back? Are you down here? Okay, um, yeah, that's fine. Just call me when you get here. All right, bye. Oh, all right. Uh, so I'll, I'll wrap this up soon, but, but keep okay. going. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, I came at him with a smile. And when they were paying attention over there, we hit, hit him a few times and, you know, we skirted and uh, he didn't tell on me. You know, he didn't tell on us. There was two of us. But uh, yeah, I mean, 
there's relations with guards on a regular, you know, I don't see them all, you know, if you're smart enough to be having a relations with the guard, you should just be smart enough not to discuss it too, you know, it's like a high school in there, you know that bro, what starts off as a little whisper here by the time it gets to here is a huge big old melee story. There was a fist fight that turned into a riot by the time it gets over to here. You know what I mean? You start off with the real and then you end up with Wes Watson. <laughs> People are jealous as well. If they know you're in a relationship, they think they get oh, rid of you, maybe oh. they got a chance. And not only that, just the jealousy factor and period. People are always jealous. You got drugs coming in. I mean, I got story upon story on that, you know, cigarettes. I was getting cigarettes from a, a Hispanic who was a Spisa. He, he ran the newspaper for the county jail. He would bring the newspapers in and I worked night crew for uh, the trash, you know, and he, he happened to be a, my best friend who was a Syrian guy at the time. Uh, he was a regular client customer of his, at the liquor store and I knew him, you know what I mean? I was like, hey bro, what's up, what's good? And, and I'm all tell off seen. So he started bringing me cigarettes. Well, uh, another Hispanic had seen this and he tried getting at him and it turned into a huge ordeal for me. You know what I mean? Cause cigarettes were going for 10 bucks a, a stick, you know, $10 a stick at the time and I'm getting a carton, you know? Uh, yeah, it turned into any kind of jealousy of, over anything. It don't matter. Cookies, nine jellies, like my homeboy said, nine jellies, whatever it is. Jealousy runs, thrives in there. You know? Yeah, I see people smash each other over an old orange or an old grapefruit or a stale brownie. <laughs> a slice of bread, man. <laughs> you <know? laughs> yeah. You're so yeah. hungry in there. You save your apple core to eat that sucker in the middle of the night, you know, and hope a seed grows. <laughs> <laughs> Badger, I could speak to you for hours. You've got so many stories. I want to thank you for doing this part two. Yeah. Just want to do a big shout out to Big Herc because it was through Big Herc's channel that I found you. Sure. Big Herc's videos are so inspirational. been watching his long form interviews. Also watching APS, watching Josh, watching Wes Watson, all those guys doing great work, spreading the word, getting the story out there, what it's like. So um, I urge people, if you've enjoyed this interview, to click down in the description box. Go over to OG Badger's channel and subscribe to his channel and check his stories out. It's not just prison stuff. There's inspirational stuff down there as well. And, you know, Trafficking, uh, homelessness, the whole nine yards, prostitution, everybody. I hit everybody. I deal with the homeless on a regular. So, you know, I get to little taste of everybody. So and I'm going to do some interviews with people coming in that I put in the beds from now on, too. So, yeah, just. You know, I just wanted to let let everybody know that it's not just that. So thank you for saying that, Sean. And I hope we can do a part three. And uh, if you want us to do a part three, if you're watching this, please put your thoughts in the comments below this video. If you've got questions for Badger, please put them in the comments below this video. If you've not subscribed to my channel, subscription logo is in the bottom right hand corner. And huge thank you to all the people who've donated on Patreon, PayPal, just giving to enable me to set up this home studio and keep running with my true crime podcast. So cheers to you in California from London, brother. Respect, bro, respect. Hopefully we talk again soon. Thank you, Sean, I appreciate the time. You know, uh, it's been a pleasure talking with you. So yeah, no, you get a little of something in common with my girl, it was funny enough, you know? So uh, I was wondering if I was gonna get her back from you. <laughs> <laughs> you're dating a Brit that's fantastic and I'm going to organize something with Wildman as well where we can all have a chat through webcam because we're both banned from America so we'll, we'll figure that out beautiful beautiful looking forward to talking to you again Sean cheers thanks man take care cheers man alright